On a clear December morning in 2021, 70-year-old Air Force veteran Michael Cranford led a three-ship formation flight south of Colorado Springs in the home-built Vans RV4 he had personally completed just a year earlier. As the group approached a narrow river canyon near Colorado's Cucharas Reservoir, winds strengthened above the rim. Cranford descended into the canyon to begin low-level maneuvering. Seconds later, his left wing struck the canyon wall and the airplane disintegrated. So today we're asking, how does a 20,000-hour military aviator flying a fully functional aircraft end up in a fatal canyon turn accident on a calm, cloudless day? Let's find out. Now let's start with the pilot. Michael Cranford wasn't inexperienced, careless, or reckless. He'd accumulated over 20,181 flight hours, a huge number for any general aviation pilot, and he had a long history as a U.S. Air Force aviator. He was flying under basic med and was well known at Meadow Lake Airport. But here's an important detail that investigators highlighted. Of those 20,000 hours, only about 23 hours were in the Vans RV4. This distinction matters. Experience absolutely helps, but experience in the specific aircraft matters even more. The RV4 is not a Cessna 172 and it's not a large stable Air Force trainer. It's a lightweight, high-performance, extremely responsive experimental airplane. With a 180 horsepower engine and a light airframe, the RV4 has a high power-to-weight ratio, very quick roll response, and a tendency to gain speed rapidly in a descent. Those qualities make it beloved by many pilots, but they also mean the airplane can go from nimble to unforgiving quickly when flown near terrain. Cranford's mission that morning wasn't a cross-country cruise. It was a formation practice flight with planned low-level maneuvering near the Kukaras Reservoir and the River Canyon north of it. Formation flying itself adds workload, especially for the lead pilot. Lead has to hold headings, set speeds, watch terrain, maintain smooth changes, and keep the formation coherent. More of your attention stays outside the cockpit, and less mental space is left for asking bigger strategic questions like, are the winds right for this today? Or should we reconsider our plan? There's also a subtle cultural factor. Military aviators are used to tightly structured missions, detailed briefs, and clear operational boundaries. But when you combine an experimental, home-built aircraft, mountain terrain, and a self-designed practice mission, that safety structure disappears. You're now not just the pilot. You're the mission planner, the safety officer, and the risk manager. So by the time the three RV approached the reservoir, nothing had gone wrong yet, but the ingredients for a hazardous scenario were already present. A very capable but highly sensitive airplane, a pilot with limited model-specific experience, a low-level practice profile, lead pilot workload, mountainous terrain with unknown wind behavior. All of this set the stage for what would happen next. Even though the sky was clear, the wind pattern that morning was anything but harmless. The nearest weather station at Walsenburg showed clear skies, 10-mile visibility, and winds 280 at 13 knots, gusting 23. The kind of matter that looks benign to many general aviation pilots, especially those who don't fly in mountainous regions. But mountain flying has its own rules. The more important question is, what are the winds doing over the ridges, through the valleys, and inside the canyons? One of the other pilots in the formation later told investigators that a few thousand feet above the surface, he was seeing strong south-southwest winds around 35 miles per hour, close to 30 knots. For mountain flying, that's right, in the zone where instructors begin teaching strong caution. Many mountain flying schools use a simple guideline, avoid ridge or canyon operations when winds aloft exceed 25 to 30 knots. The reason is simple. When that much air is forced over mountains, it becomes unstable, tumbling, and unpredictable. Okay, imagine the wind flowing toward a mountain as a river flowing toward rocks. If the flow is light, water simply slides over and around the stones. But when the flow increases, water begins to curl, tumble, and create rapids. Air behaves the same way. When strong winds push against a mountain ridge, the air is forced upward, then oscillates on the downwind side, creating mountain waves, large regions of rising and sinking air. Closer to the surface, these waves break into rotors, which are rolling swirls of air that can toss a light airplane violently. Now picture a narrow canyon like the one north of uh, Kukaras Reservoir. Canyons act like funnels. The wind can accelerate, swirl, shift direction, and even reverse relative to what a pilot feels above the rim deputies who responded to the crash described the winds inside the canyon as strong and variable, significantly different from what they experienced above the rim. It's important to emphasize that none of this shows up on a meter. None of it was visible from the sky. There were no clouds, no storms, no obvious warning signs. 
but for a light, responsive airplane flying close to the canyon walls, a sudden gust, just a few seconds long, can push the aircraft toward terrain faster than the pilot can counter. So even before Cranford descended, the environmental trap was already assembled. Gusty surface conditions, stronger winds aloft, a terrain configuration known to create rotors and eddies, a narrow canyon with no margin for error. It was a classic case of invisible winds, weather that looks completely harmless until you enter the one place where it becomes dangerous. North of the reservoir, Cranford made the call, go trail. That instruction signaled the formation to switch from a looser echelon structure to a single file lineup, one aircraft behind the other, which is common before starting low level maneuvering Cranford as lead, then began a descending left turn into the Cucharas River Canyon. This moment is where the accident truly begins, not because a part failed, but because formation flying, terrain, wind, and human factors all converged. Here's why formation to trail transitions matter. When the flight switches to trail, each pilot's situational awareness becomes narrower. Lead focuses on terrain, speed, and smooth control inputs. Number two focuses on lead. Number three focuses on two. Everyone's view of the big picture shrinks. In a dynamic environment, changing winds, descending turns, terrain rising on both sides, this narrowing of attention makes it easy to miss cues that something has changed. One of the trailing pilots later reported feeling strong turbulence and seeing signs of significant surface winds near the canyon rim. That pilot made a crucial decision. Instead of following lead into the canyon, he chose to stay above the rim and watch the situation unfold from a safer altitude. This creates a striking contrast. Two pilots, flying the same route, receiving the same information, one descends, the other stays high. It's a perfect example of risk perception. It's not about skill. It's not about courage. It's simply how two trained individuals interpret the same conditions differently in real time. Now add the concept of energy state. Imagine you're descending into a canyon with a tailwind. Your airspeed might be 120 knots, but with a 20 knot tailwind, your ground speed is 140 knots. That means you eat up terrain faster and have less time to recognize hazards. If turbulence bumps you into a slightly steeper bank or a faster descent, that margin shrinks even further. Inside a canyon, even a small misjudgment in speed or bank angle can remove your ability to make the next turn. And in this case, with strong variable winds, the margin was almost certainly razor thin from the moment November 456, Mike Charlie dropped below the rim. Once Cranford descended below the canyon rim, the environment changed in an instant. According to the other two pilots, less than a minute passed between entering the canyon and the fatal collision. During what appeared to be the third turn, they saw the RV-4's left wing strike the canyon wall at high speed, followed by immediate fragmentation. When investigators examined the wreckage, they found no indication of mechanical failure. The engine was producing power, the propeller was rotating, and the flight controls showed continuity. This was a fully functional airplane, overwhelmed by terrain, speed, and wind. To understand why things deteriorated so quickly, it helps to imagine the geometry at work. Picture yourself flying inside a canyon at around 120 knots. At that speed, a moderate 30 degree bank produces a turn radius of roughly 2,000 feet. But many mountain canyons, including the one north of Cucheras Reservoir, can narrow to less than half that width. If your speed stays high, the laws of physics simply don't allow you to turn tightly enough to stay inside the canyon. Even an aggressive steeper bank reduces the radius only so far, and steep banks also demand more lift, leaving you with less stall margin in gusty air. Now add turbulence the kind the sheriff's office later described as strong and variable. In a smooth turn, the airplane responds only to your inputs. But in a gusty canyon, the airplane responds to wind as much as to the pilot. A sudden rolling gust can unexpectedly increase bank angle, push the airplane sideways, or momentarily unload the wings. At low altitude, these small, abrupt changes can erase your remaining safety margin. The RV-4's personality makes this even more challenging. It's agile and responsive. Fantastic traits at altitude, but unforgiving near terrain. In turbulence, a light RV can react instantly to a gust. That sensitivity can cause uncommanded roll, yaw, or pitch changes. A small bump at the wrong moment can widen a turn, shallow a climb, or shift the aircraft laterally toward the canyon wall. Another important concept is maneuvering speed, or VA. Many pilots treat VA as a turbulence protection setting, but it's not a shield. Being below VA means a gust is more likely to produce a stall before structural damage. Not that the airplane will stay controllable. A stall only a few dozen feet from a rocky wall is not survivable. The left wing impact point tells a story. The airplane likely wasn't intentionally descending toward the wall. Instead, it was pushed or drifted laterally, either by a gust, by tailwind-induced widening of the turn, 
or simply by not having enough space for the chosen airspeed and bank angle. Inside a canyon, even a single second of drift can be unrecoverable. When two highly experienced pilots flying nearly identical airplanes react differently to the same conditions, it's worth exploring the human factors involved. One trailing pilot encountered turbulence near the rim and immediately stayed high. Cranford continued downward. That divergence highlights one of the most powerful forces in aviation, risk perception. The NTSB ruled out medical incapacitation. Toxicology was clean, and although Cranford had severe coronary artery disease, there was no sign of an in-flight event. Instead, what likely shaped his decisions were familiar cognitive patterns that affect even the most seasoned aviators. The first is the experience trap. When a pilot has flown thousands of hours across decades, new hazards can sometimes appear handled. Even when the environment is unfamiliar, Cranford had tens of thousands of hours, but only 23 hours in the RV-4. Experience transfers unevenly across aircraft types. A lightweight, high-performance experimental behaves very differently from the heavier, more stable airplanes common in military or transport operations. Next is planned continuation bias, the tendency to stick with the original mission even when conditions change. The goal that morning was low-level maneuvering in the canyon. Descending into it wasn't a deviation. It was the mission. Once a pilot commits mentally to a profile, especially one briefed with peers, the threshold for aborting becomes psychologically higher. There's also the subtle pressure of being formation lead. Leaders set the tone, they pace the group, make the calls, and manage the flow. Even in informal recreational flying, lead pilots often feel responsible for keeping the mission smooth and predictable. That responsibility can unintentionally push a pilot toward continuing a maneuver, even when conditions feel less than ideal. Then we have task saturation. Inside the canyon, Cranford's workload would have increased rapidly. Tight terrain, descending turns, shifting winds, sensitive controls, formation considerations, airspeed and geometry concerns. When a pilot's cognitive load maxes out, strategic thinking fades. It becomes all about the immediate task, pitch, bank, roll, altitude, and less about the big picture question, should I still be here? Finally, there's the contrast with the trailing pilot. He felt the turbulence, stayed high, and preserved his options. Both men were skilled, both had good judgment, but they made different decisions because they had different workloads and different vantage points at the decisive moment. The NTSB concluded that the accident resulted from Cranford's failure to maintain clearance from terrain while maneuvering at low altitude inside the canyon. Contributing factors included his decision to enter the canyon at low altitude and the sudden variable wind conditions within it. But the broader lessons go far beyond the official line. This accident illustrates how mountain flying, turbulence, and human factors can quietly stack together. No single factor caused the tragedy, terrain, wind, speed, aircraft responsiveness, mission expectations, and workload all combined into a scenario where even a small gust became insurmountable. FAA mountain flying guidance gives clear, timeless principles. Avoid canyon operations when winds at ridge height exceed 25 to 30 knots. Make a recon pass above the rim before descending. Stay on the windward side of the canyon for maximum turning room. Maintain an escape path and be ready to abandon the plan early. This case also demonstrates the importance of SA-023, manage risk, recognizing hazardous attitudes, resisting plan continuation bias, and setting personal limits that are stricter than the regulations require. In the end, this wasn't about inexperience or carelessness. It was about how quickly multiple small risks can align in the mountains. The lesson is simple. Even the most experienced pilots must respect terrain, wind, and the invisible forces flowing between them.